every fandom, there are creative figures which, fairly or unfairly, are considered controversial. In Star Trek right now, it's Alex Kurtzman. For the longest of time, the X-Men had Tom Rothman to contend with. And for Star Wars fans, it's Ryan Johnson. Among others. Within the fandom of Sonic the Hedgehog, that controversial figure is Ken Penders. His run on the Archie comic series Sonic the Hedgehog and associated spin-offs are frequently referred to as batshit insane, and he is infamous for a lawsuit involving him and Archie Comics, a lawsuit which he won. But with that level of infamy also comes some level of misrepresentation. Of all the stories about the man out there, many are one-sided, and therefore might not show the full picture. In this video, we will add some nuance and frequently overlooked perspective to the discussion of all things Sonic, as we hear the first-hand account from the one who wasn't just there, but in the center of it all. Welcome, Ken Penders. Thank you. It's good to be here. And it's good to have you. And also joining us for this interview is Tom. How's it going? Good afternoon. I'm doing all right. Excellent. Nice to see and before we begin, though, let's just establish where we are and what we know and what we don't know. For myself, I'm a fan of Sega growing up. I'm very much so a Sega Mega Drive kid. I obviously then played the original Sega trilogy of Sonic 1, Sonic 2, and Sonic 3. But outside of those, I'm more aware of the comics and the various animations than I read than I read them myself. So I know of you, Ken Penders, uh, from your reputation, which precedes you, but I haven't read too much of your run myself, I must admit. Tom, how about you? Um, I'm pretty much in the same boat for the most part. Again, I was I grew up with the games. Uh, I was aware of the animated series. Uh, I do recall the comics. I do know some of the storylines. Again, I haven't had the liberty to read them all. Um, but as like Andre, <laughs> my knowledge of you, sir, is that you're uh, uh, quite the controversial figure within the Sonic world. So it'll be interesting to talk to you today about all this, I'm sure. Yeah. So basically what we're saying is that we go in relatively free of preconceived notions and we have uh, no firm opinion in advance. So we are very interested to hear your side of events, which I understand uh, isn't always the same as the narrative that's out there already, many of which comes from individuals who maybe aren't there to, to uh, amend that narrative. Well, a lot of the story that has gotten out there over the years has been perpetuated by a lot of people who like to think that they're in the know or that they have access to those in, in the know. And that's not really so because for the longest time, especially at the beginning, um, when I first got involved with Sonic, I had already been working in comics for, um, oh, about seven years. I had uh, had work published at DC Comics, Marvel Comics, uh, Now Comics, um, Malibu, uh, Innovation, number of other sm small publishers. Um, yeah, I know your work from the Savage Sword of Conan, for instance, which I happen to be a huge fan of. I'm impressed, I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it was a it was a totally different world back then. There was no internet, you know, during, you know, prior to Sonic. I was living in New Hampshire. Uh, I had a family, and uh, I was um, I was working for a defense contractor, a consulting firm, uh, doing computer graphics. But that was not my love, and I wanted to. Um, break into comics. So I put in a portfolio and uh, I went down to New York City and I showed it to um, uh, art director John Romita. And uh, he in turn showed me off to a couple other editors. 
And from there, after meeting with them at Marvel, I went over across the town to DC Comics, where I met with editor Robert Greenberger. And Bob ended up giving me my um, first uh, actual professional comics assignment, which was uh, uh, the Who's Who in Star Trek assignment, which was released when Star Trek IV came out to the theaters. And um, so I began establishing relationships at the various companies. And I was starting out primarily as an artist. So, you know, basically it, it was a totally different world back then. You could literally um, get on a train, go down to New York City in a few hours, and actually meet with editors at Marvel and DC and other publishers, uh, which I did. Um, and after getting my first few assignments, I actually got into um, – a DC intern program that was started off by Dick Giordano. And that's how I ended up uh, meeting um, editor Elliot Megan, for example, uh, who uh, eventually gave me assignments on the TSR license books. So by the time I got to Sonic, I already had uh, accumulated a number of credits on various license titles, including Star Trek, Green Hornet, Legend of Zelda, um, Savage Sword of Conan, uh, Transformers. So uh, when Sonic came around, uh, it it was it was quite by accident because up until that point too, um, I was primarily an artist, and I was discovering that if I wanted to get more steady work, more regular work, that it would be better if I initiated the project as a writer rather than waiting for a writer to have an assignment tossed into the editor that he could hand to me. Um, so when Sonic happened along, it was, it was totally by accident. My uh, friend, Mike Kandorovich, he was a frequent partner of uh, uh, editor Tom Brevoort over at Marvel uh, before he became an editor. This is when he was a freelancer, and they would work a on a lot of the Marvel kids' titles. And as such, um, editor uh, Paul Castiglia at Archie was familiar with Mike and Tom's work. And when writer Mike Gallagher, who had been with the series since the very beginning, uh, the first miniseries, uh, he decided he was going to up and leave to go work at Marvel on the Guardians of the Galaxy title. Um, that's when editor Paul Castiglia put in a, a call to Mike uh, because he, he and Mike hung out in the same circles. Mike, though, didn't have any knowledge of Sonic the Hedgehog whatsoever. And at that point, I had already been buying the comics for my son. I had uh, bought the video game, uh, the video console, uh, as a Christmas present uh, prior to... Um, even buying the comic books. And as such, he was he was a huge fan that when Mike called me up saying, look at Paul uh, has this uh, assignment, something called Sonic the Hedgehog, but I don't know the first thing about it. I told him, why don't you come on over? You know, he's my son's favorite character. Let's work out a couple ideas and, and, and go from there. And the thing was... At that point, there was only uh, the comic books. I think there was something like eight issues out. Um, there was, I know the first video game was out. I'm not quite sure if the second had, had come out by the time Mike contacted me. It was roughly about that time, but I'm not sure if I saw it or not. And I think the cartoons were just starting to come on the air, but I'm not quite sure. And so, yeah, it was about October of 1993 when we, uh, he came to my, over to my house and we sat down in my basement studio and we started, you know, bouncing ideas back and forth. And we came up with three pitches, one of which um, was uh, Sonic meeting his evil doppelganger. Another was Sonic meeting... Uh, a version of the Mario Brothers, only we could, we had them dentists instead of uh, plumbers, and another was uh, uh, 
uh, a story about Sonic and his chili dogs. It was there were three there were three pitches, and we submitted them to say we faxed them over to Paul, and you know Paul in turn faxed them over to to Sega, and they in turn approved two of the storylines, and totally rejected the the Mario satire. They didn't want. They wanted nothing to do with that whatsoever. So we, uh, you know, Paul gave us the go ahead uh, to, you know, turn these pitches into full scripts. Okay, keep in mind, uh, scripts can be any number of things. For some people uh, at various companies, they're writing up a full text script. You know, scene, dialogue, that sort of thing. With Archie at the time, we we were told we had to submit the scripts in uh, page panel layout format. Basically, I would do the layouts and uh, it would indicate where the word balloons would be, the sound effects, where the, the placement of the characters, everything. It was like a very rough version of what you saw in the finished published comics. And this would prove important later on down the road when I was uh, applying for my copyrights, though I had no clue at the time how significant that was. And so we turned in the ideas and I, I have documentation. I actually have the, the story pitches and I have Sega's response. Um, uh, you know, I kept all that correspondence from the early years. So we submitted they approved it. We were asked to submit more ideas. And before we knew it, um, our first published issue was um, issue 11. And from there, uh, we just kept getting asked. As soon as we turned in one story, they would ask us to turn in another. And I was, it was then I was became aware of the cartoons that were coming on the air. Um, I checked out a few episodes of the, uh, weekday animated series. Uh, I thought they were a little bit too silly for my taste, but I did like what I was seeing on the Saturday AM uh, series. So we were only working with Paul for a short time when he was replaced by editor Scott Fulop. And when that happened, I approached Scott and I said, um, I requested, I should say, that could we, you know, gear the book more toward um, the Saturday AM series rather than the weekday series? Because up until that point, uh, and, and as we found out, Sega really didn't have any idea what they wanted in terms of stories. They were dependent on writers to submit ideas, which they would decide, okay, yeah, we'll, we like that one, we'll go with that, or no, we don't like that, you know, ditch it. Um, and basically, it was agreed that the format would be more like the silly stories um, in the weekday animated series, because that's what the original uh, writer and artist who worked on the book before us, um, that would be writer Mike Gallagher and artist Scott Shaw and Dave Manick, those guys were all from the humor side of um, freelancing. Uh, they, Mike and Dave had worked on Cracked and Mad Magazine. And, and uh, Scott Shaw, he was definitely into, into the Flintstones and uh, all other sorts of cartoony uh, subject matter. So they were very comfortable with that. Yes, because from my understanding, uh, I certainly this is my recollection from the early books that came out in my native, native Norway, was that the mythos was pretty bare bones in those early days. Whereas when you took over, what you did was you massively expanded on both the lore, the mythos and the universe about Archie Sonic and all the characters in it. What was it that led you to that direction of oh. making everything so much more ambitious than it had been? Okay, what what led me in that direction was more or less uh, a 
a desperation to fulfill a need here. You got to keep in mind that when we started, when Mike and I, my partner Mike Kanerovich and I, when we started working on the book, we simply thought that we were just submitting a few stories and that would be that. Uh, we had no inclination, for example, uh, the book was going to go beyond issue 12, issue 15, whatever. We, uh, you know, you have to understand that back in the 90s, you know, if a comic series lasted more than a do dozen issues, uh, that was a major thing uh, because a lot of series would come out and they would die, you know, really quick if they didn't meet any sales figures. And Sonic wasn't getting great sales numbers from the direct market, so they were solely dependent upon newsstand sales. And we never got the impression from management at Archie that this was any more than a short-term project. You know, the idea of issue 25, for example, coming out, that was unheard of. It was, you, nobody even imagined that. So it, it took us about four or five months of submitting various scripts and going through the process. And then we started getting asked for, to submit more material. And by more material, we were being told that there was going to be an upcoming 48-page special. There was going to be uh, a Princess Sally miniseries. And they wanted to have some sort of tie-in from the regular comic leading into these projects. So that required you know, us coming up with more material. So uh, initially we were just riffing off of old comic books, cartoons, uh, whatever, because we just didn't see any direction from that was usable from any other source material. Um, Sega wasn't providing it to us. Uh, we kept asking for reference material from the Deke animated series. I, I wouldn't even get that until like issue 35, 36 when I was working on that. Um, so it, it was it was out of necessity that, you know, we had to come up with more and new material. So, you know, that's when I started giving thought, okay, how did these characters come to be in this situation? Um, and, you know, where are the parents? Where are, where are all the adult figures? So I started with something uh, like a mentor figure for Sally because she was the leader of the group and we came up with Julela. And so uh, from there, you know, we did this three part story. It was it started in issue 17, went to issue 18, and then it went to the Sonic in your face special one, which was Princess Sally's crusade. And, and, um, that was the very first time that there was a multi-issue storyline uh, attempted in the Sonic series. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can't even recall if Archie was doing multi-issue stories at that time. I don't recall so because the initial Sonic format was based on the standard Archie format. You know, three, five to six page stories, one eleven page stories, that's something like that. And, and then when it came time to do the story for issue nine, uh, we came up with this multiverse story. And I, I said to editor Scott Fulp, I'm going to need a full issue. He said, go for it. So that was the first, you know, complete issue story. And, you know, one thing kept leading to another. And Scott would say, what else have you got? So, uh, and then he would ask, what else have you got? And then he'd say, okay, I like this. Um, can you give me more of that? Whatever. And then there was the issue with Knuckles. Knuckles, uh, um, initially with Knuckles, uh, that was one of the first requests Scott made to me. Can I do a story with Knuckles? And so Mike and I came up with a storyline that was eventually published in issue 13 of Sonic the Hedgehog. So this was something that came down from Sega. It was a request because of the upcoming Sonic 
three games. Yeah, I figured as much. Because, I mean, for some context, I know for some of our younger listeners, they may not understand because everything is so, you know, cohesive now and synergy. You know, comic books match the novels, which match the movie, which match the spinoff TV shows. Back at this time, it wasn't abnormal for, like, a, a book series to not match the TV series, to not match the comic book series, to not match the <laughs> whatever series. Exactly. As a matter of fact, like, right now, right now, I am hearing from people telling me that there was a Japanese manga that featured Sonic's parents that was published back in 1992. Let me tell you something. And back when I started working on Sonic, we were totally unaware of any such animal. We didn't even know the European Sonic the comic existed. I didn't even see any issues of that or know its existence until the year 2000 when editor Justin Gabri sent me copies of the book. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff, a lot of material out there that we were totally unaware was ex even existed and that Sega never even informed us about. Uh, it, it was an interesting situation. Sega of America never communicated with Sega of Europe or Sega of Japan as far as we could see, and neither did the other branches talk to anybody else right because nowadays you'd get handed a bible that had all the rules and characters and everything set in stone pretty much it seems like compared right. to then right right and, it, and it, the thing was as i was going through the lawsuit as well i became aware that archie had a clause in their contract with sega that they had to notify um if they were going to include any new characters in the book they had to give Sega notice of that, and Sega would approve, you know, let them know if they approved or not. That Archie never told us about that. They never uh, informed us you could or could not create new characters. You had to get approval. They just, you know, kept taking whatever we were submitting, and uh, Sega never said anything either at their end, you know. And we were dealing with the Sega licensing manager. Uh, Robert Harris at the initially, you know, and the only thing that uh, Bob Harris had to comment as far as their scripts, uh, I think he must have been a failed writer or something because he kept on inserting himself on some of our jokes and he would tick off Mike quite a bit because Mike really had a great sense of humor. He, he actually submitted more of the humor material in our scripts than I did. I was just uh, trying to keep up with Mike as far as the humor. Uh, he had great dialogue. Uh, I was more the plot guy at that time. I was just getting comfortable uh, writing dialogue. But Mike had definitely had an ear for it. Um, so we never saw any of this material. And so, you know, we kept getting requests. Okay, what do you got for us now? And then, and here we're going to, or being told we're going to do the Princess Sally miniseries. What do you suggest? You know, the Princess Sally miniseries is, is a great example there. Um, here was a character that was established in the Saturday AM series. Um, they were, you know, when Archie came out with the book, they essentially did this hybrid, used characters from the Saturday AM series, and, you know, with the weekday f humor format. So when we were asked to do, Mike and I were asked to do the Princess Sally miniseries, uh, they said, what do you got? And our initial pitch, that's when we came up with, you know, Sally was going to encounter her mother. And in the series, uh, Sonic had an Uncle Chuck that was roboticized. And, you know, my next question was, well, what happened to everybody else? You know, all the other adults that were w with the kids. So we figured that we would answer that question with the Sally miniseries. And we figured that uh, Sally's mom was roboticized and she was leading this underground, you know, population, you know, in this in the sewer system beneath uh, the kingdom. And uh, Sally was finally going to encounter her. And we were going to make the mother the villain. And Sega thought that was too dark and they wanted something else. They wanted something 
uh, more adventurous and uh, more humor. So Mike and I did a riff on Thelma and Louise, whereas uh, Sally and Bunny Rabbit took a road trip. You know, we figured, okay, we're going to explore the landscape, find out where the bad guys are, and uh, see what can be done. And Sega said, nope, we don't want the, the thing focused on Sally and Bunny. So then they did came back and they asked us, how about we do something? All we can use is Sally and all we can use is Robotnik uh, as for the villain. And everything else has to be original. So that's where I came up with um, Jeffrey St. John, you know, as a potential love interest uh, for or and rival for Sonic. Uh, and there were a group of trainees who would become the next freedom fighter. So and we submitted that. That was like our last ditch effort. That was something we really had no intention of uh, submitting until, until that point. And it's only because there was nothing else left to try. And so they approved it, and we did the miniseries. But then Archie, it turned out, uh, they weren't interested in doing it. It was done simply as a favor to Sega. So they never promoted it, um, and it was just out there. And even though uh, Sega was very much interested in doing a Princess Sally video game at the time, they were promoting it as such at the 1995 Toy Fair. Yes, it was. Do you think this was more of a testing ground to see if there was enough interest in it, maybe? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. Absolutely. I, I, I think so. They wanted... Uh, Sega was always trying to see if they where they could expand the market. They were concerned that Sonic was going to be perceived too much in America as... Uh, a kid-centric uh, brand rather than uh, they wanted more hip and cool for the teens and older crowd. So they were wondering what it would take to expand the audience. And so uh, at one point they were interested in maybe Princess Sally uh, growing the female base. You know, the interesting uh, part was the Sonic comic from our evidence, we were growing the female base because when I initially came on board uh, to write stories, I was initially told that the audience for the series were boys six to 12 years old. And by the time uh, three or four uh, issues had come out that I had worked on, we were starting to receive mail from a lot of female rate readers. We were getting pictures, you know, it, it was, it was fascinating. We, we, had never seen that before, and our mail began to grow exponentially each issue. Um, so that's, you know, uh, that was also the mail. I have to I have to talk about the mail. The mail was also a critical function in letting us know what the kids were interested in. And you know, every time we would introduce a new element, or I introduced a new element. Um, the kids would say, "Okay, well, what about this part?" You know, if uh, Sally is a mom. What about her dad? You know, what's out there? You know, what about the, the parents of the other people, the other characters? So would that kind of con uh, kind of contribute to how you would go with the direction of the stories, or is that more to do with what Sega would approve or not approve? Oh, I at a certain point, it wasn't so much a matter. Once Bob Harris left, uh, it wasn't so much a matter. We were concerned what Sega would or wouldn't approve uh, because. It was more, at that point, all I had to do is make certain we didn't do material that would offend the Archie publisher. For example, uh, we couldn't do anything that depicted guns, okay? So we had uh, paintball weapons, you know, that kind of thing. Or it, it was always something that w was not designed to kill. We, it, uh, we had to watch that we didn't feature anything of a suggestive or adult nature, and, and for by and large, for the most part, uh, there there was not a problem. It was okay. We're not. We don't have to talk down to the kids. We can do some interesting stuff, but uh, uh, we're grown ups enough. We can figure it out. You know what works and what doesn't. Before long, um, 
nobody was uh, telling us what to do at that point. It was like we had total free reign. Um, I was submitting whatever I wanted. And as a matter of fact, that is what kept me uh, going on the series for so long, that this this freedom that to do whatever I wanted, to, to pitch whatever came to my mind. Uh, so it, it was fun. It, 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 it's like, okay, I'm working at home, and I don't have to go into the office. And that was great. You know, it made things a lot more fun. As long as I met the deadlines, whatever they told me to do, I, w I was happy. Uh, it was it was great. Uh, the, the added benefit was, since the book was my son's favorite series, uh, I, I would get to check try out my stories on him before they even, you know, were sent to the artist. You know, because he'd look at my page layouts and, He'd follow along and he'd say, yeah, I like that. I like that. And he'd make suggestions. And and I went with that sometimes. And uh, it, it was fun. It was, it was definitely, um, there was no rhyme or reason. Just whatever uh, came to mind that I thought would uh, flow from one book to the other. You also have to keep in mind that because we were a new stand book and we were dependent upon sales. I was always conscious that um, where we were selling. Okay. I was always concerned that at some point the book was going to just die. And this isn't, you know, looking to think pessimistically. This is just realistically. This is how the, the comic book industry operated. You know. Well, not just that it's a licensed product, a licensed comic. So usually those don't tend to last nearly as long. Exactly. Exactly. As a matter of fact, uh, by the time I was working on the script for issue 35, 36, um, I got a call from editor Scott Fulham and he told me that the series, the, this both animated series had been canceled. Um, and as a result, what normally happens is, you know, any licensed product, you know, like a comic book, uh, a series of novels, what have you, based on a property that's off a toy or a TV series or a film, they are usually out of the market within six to eight months after that. And so he figured within eight months, you know, the book was as good as dead. And so I, it, it was that phone call that prompted me to ask Scott, all right, how about um, we, we shoot for issue 50? This, uh, this is probably optimistic on my part, but the last story of the book should be like uh, a multi-parter, you know, basically the final battle between Sonic versus Robotnik. And Scott thought that was a great idea. So he said, you know, start developing it. So you know, around the time issue 36, that's when I started jotting down notes for what would become Endgame. And so my stories at that point began to lead up to a point uh, where we thought, okay, we're heading toward the wrap up. What are we going to do? And one of the things I wanted to do uh, more than anything is we had a character, Antoine, from the Saturday AM series. And I cannot begin to tell you how much mail we got on a regular basis uh, from readers saying they absolutely hated the character. They wanted us to kill him off, that sort of thing. And I sort of took it as a badge of honor to see if I could take this most hated character and turn him into something that the readers would become interested in. So... It was with issue 46, I introduced the element that uh, Bunny Rabbit was attracted to him. And basically, you know, once the reader saw that, hey, but Bunny found something redeeming about this character that she was attracted to, they wanted to know more. So, but I wasn't sure how much more I would get to develop, but it, it, was, it was very fascinating to see the reaction once, once I did that. So then came the time let's see, it was around about issue 42. We, I was working on the scripts for 41, 42, around there when 
Justin asked if I was coming down into New York and uh, he wanted to discuss Endgame. Justin Debris had now taken over from Scott Fulham. So I came down to New York and um, Justin was thinking of having me write the overall arc of the story for Endgame, but he was thinking uh, Scott would be a co-writer with me on issue 48, um, that Mike Gallagher would be a co-writer on issue 49, and then Scott Fulop, uh Mike Gallagher, and uh, new writer Carol Bowlers um, would be, uh, would, would write uh, issue 50. And basically what those guys did on each of, you know, wherever issue they worked on is they would work on the dialogue, whereas I supplied the plot, you know, page panel breakdown. And uh, so I wrote all of issue 47 myself, wrote the plot uh, page panel breakdown for 48, 49, most of 50, but I also wrote several pages uh, myself for issue 50. And Justin initially suggested issue 50 was going to be uh, a 48 page special, you know, with 40 pages for the story and art. So I planned issue 50 initially as that 40, you know, page story. But then the publisher said, no, for reasons having to do with the mail subscriptions, they couldn't put in the extra pages. So I had to pare the story down to seven, 27 pages, um, which took out quite a bit of key elements there. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a total hatch job, but still that's what had to be done. So it was. Um, so why did they do that instead of just spreading it over two issues? Uh, because they were still hesitant where the book was going to go from there. Um, they were, they, when Justin gave the go ahead for end game, uh, I think they were just starting to get a hunch that the book was actually going to continue past issue 50, but nobody was saying anything at that point. And Justin asked me to do the follow-up for Endgame, which became Sonic Super Special uh, Brave New World, which I completely wrote and illustrated. And then at that point, that's when they decided they were going to do Knuckles as a series. You know, they were figuring, okay, here, if we keep Sonic going, how can we expand the line? And at that point, I was offered a choice. Do I want to be the sole writer on Sonic or do I want to be the sole writer on Knuckles? And, you know, I could have one, but not the other. Because basically, Justin wanted to be able to give Mike and Carl uh, assignments as well. So I opted at that point for the Knuckles series. And my reasons for doing so uh, were, were simple. It was that Knuckles was a totally blank slate. There was nothing there except what I had previously developed. And I figured, okay, here's a chance. I, I'm going to sink or swim on this one. So I figured whatever happened, I will get the recognition or the blame, and I can live with the consequences. So that's what happened, you know, once I did um, the Endgame story and Sonic Brave New World, then I began work on the Knuckles series, and Mike and Carl ended up, you know, splitting up doing, you know, Sonic issues after that. The interesting part was um, once they began solicitations for the issues without my involvement, they were discovering that they weren't getting orders on the same level as they were uh, prior to uh, with my name in the solicitations. So Justin asked me if I would do a story for issue 53, you know, that tied into the Knuckles book. So I said, yes, you know, fine. Uh, that was the first time I had any inkling that, you know, I even mattered the book, you know, on that level that 
they needed my name, you know, for when they were soliciting orders at, at the comic shops. Um, Archie was very, very, um, shall we say, they did not like to promote the creators. Uh, I think they were afraid that we would come at them with our hands out asking for a raise. And they never told us the sales figures either. So it, uh, it, it, was a, it was a totally new experience for me to even hear that from them, that you're, you're needed for the orders. So then uh, I did the story, and then we went back to the status quo. And then Justin start, asked me to do a series of backup stories featuring the uh, secondary characters, uh, you know, in the Sonic book, on top of my what I was doing with the Knuckles uh, series. And that continued for a long time because that way uh, Carl and Mike, they got to split up the, the bulk of the main book on alternating issues. And, you know, by me having six pages in the back, they could slap my name on the orders as well. So, and that continued for a while until um, Mike left the book again and Carl took over as the regular writer of the series. And I just, you know, stuck with Knuckles and the backup stories from that point forward. Looking back at the comics, what storyline or character development is it that you take most pride in? The the storyline, it's it's actually, the stuff I take most pride in is, is definitely the Knuckles material. And Knuckles, it was a very organic experience. Uh, it was a building block. You know, all that was in existence at the time when I started the very first Knuckles story is he was an echidna, he was guarding a Chaos Emerald on the floating island, and that was the extent of it. So, and that is reflected in the very first story that I did. And then, and here's the story about that, that first appearance. Once we did that first story, Sega didn't... Um, want us to publish it. They actually sent editor Scott Fuller um, uh, a memo saying, don't do this. But at that point, the book was already on the presses. So Scott had to tell the people at Sega, look at, okay, we can pull the book, but you're going to pay for all the costs involved, you know, for the delay, for redoing the issue, uh, for going back to press, and so on. And once Sega heard those numbers, they said, nope, fine, do what you're doing, and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. And so we did that one story with Knuckles, and we thought we were going to do more with the character, but Sega sort of, like, said, nah, you know, hold off. And it wasn't until we did the Sonic and Knuckles special that we were given the go-ahead to start developing the character, or we could do more stories with the character, I should say. And Scott basically turned the character over to me he, because he felt that um, uh, because there were going to be such irregular appearances that uh, I could maintain a consistency to it. I was also uh, drawing those early stories as well. So uh, he was killing off two birds with one stone by doing that. So I started building up uh, – trying to figure out where am I going to go with this series. So here came the Knuckles Chaotic series uh, released in the mid-90s on their uh, 32X system, Sega's 32X system. And so they provided additional characters I could add to the Knuckles mythos. But there still wasn't enough to go with as far as anything more than you know, an initial storyline. There was nothing that could support an ongoing storyline. And Scott was basically directing me to have these stories lead to uh, a, the initial Knuckles miniseries. And that's when I had to come up with a villain, a real villain that would, you know, Knuckles could call his own because as far as I could see, he didn't have one. 
So that's where I came up with Enerjack. And I came up with the concept that uh, Enerjack was really an ancestor of his. And I, so that forced me to work out a family tree. You know, if I'm going to call him an ancestor, how far back does this go? What is the lifespan? It forced me to ask all sorts of questions in, in order to make the story viable. And so we st I started showing some of that history uh, in Sonic Issues 34 through 36, uh, which was the lead-in to the miniseries. And to show you what a torturous uh, path it was to get that miniseries out, Initially, the stories that were in issue 34 through 36, they were supposed to be in 30, issues 30 through 32. But because for some reason it, the miniseries got pushed back onto the schedule, um, Scott didn't want to have a, a gap between these stories leading into the miniseries. So what he did was he pushed those stories back and he asked me to do like these interstitials leading from uh, the Knuckles Chaotic special to the storyline that we were launching in 30, issue 34. So 30, 31, 30, no, 31, 32, and 33, I did these two page storylines, you know, that were sort of like leading up to the main event. And then I had these, this three parter each of which were eight pages long, giving further backstory to Knuckles' history. And then we had the three-issue miniseries, you know, and from there, that kind of established, you know, a, a rough beginning of what the world of Knuckles was going to be like. So I thought, okay, this is it. You know, we did this, what's next? So then when... I was doing Endgame. That's when Justin said, we're, we're interested in doing another miniseries with Knuckles. He wasn't saying series, just, you know, another three-issue miniseries. And that's all I took it for. So where do I go with it from there? And that's how I came up with the Dark Legion, that they were connected uh, in some way to the initial villain, uh, Enerjack. And by the time I got done with that, what would become Knuckles, the Dark Legion miniseries. Uh, then Justin said, we're deciding to go with Knuckles as a regular series. And how it would work is you would do three issues. There would be the next month would be a Sonic Super Special. Then the next three months would be, you know, three issues of Knuckles. Then another month with the Sonic Super Special and so on. That's how it was laid out. And it went like that for about a year until then they decided they were going to do Knuckles every month as opposed to, you know, alternating three months, one month, three months, that kind of thing. So, so it forced me uh, to develop this world. And as I was developing it, um, it occurred to me that, you know, where do I want this storyline to go? What is, what is the end game here? And I decided I was essentially going to take the approach that the creator of Conan the Barbarian did, in which Robert E. Howard basically chronicled the life history of his character. He had a beginning, a middle, and an end, you know. And I figured, okay, I am building the blocks leading to some point in the future where we will see, you know, the end of Knuckles and his legacy. But it's going to be a long time before we get there, but what happens in between? And I used that as my guidebook for all the stories subsequent to that thought. You know, where is this going? And so every step of the way, I was laying building blocks. And uh, by the time I got to uh, the stories that were published in the backup of Sonic... Uh, it it became um, a real labor of love, just trying to keep it going at that point. Was there any uh, story arcs that you were uh, really proud of or characters that you really liked a lot that you created? Uh, the storylines I'm most proud of uh, 
were, the first one is the Forgotten Tribe. And that introduced the elements of uh, technology versus religion in Echidna society on a, on a personal level. And um, I, I, I was very happy uh, that we could deal with uh, some heavy topics such as faith in, in a way that the kids grasped and uh, they enjoyed it very much. And I was also able to provide uh, a richer backstory to some characters that had uh, previously been introduced. Uh, likewise, with the storyline, uh, The Forbidden Zone, which was in issues 19 through 21, um, I finally got around to answering the question about Sally's family tree, you know, particularly her mother. And in the process, um, answered a few questions about uh, Knuckles' family tree as well. And uh, that was a very well-received uh, storyline. And uh, it was pointed out, uh, even in a recent New York article, uh, how uh, positive that that storyline was. So, yeah, those those efforts I was really proud of. Just as I was uh, proud of uh, uh, the storyline that I started creating for Mobius 25 years later, which I consider to be the groundwork for the very first actual uh, graphic novel, because I was approaching that storyline uh, as chapters of an of a ongoing novel, and it featured the characters, particularly Knuckles and Julie Sue and his daughter, Lara Sue, um, down the road, you know, and, and again, how we got there is a, is a story unto itself. Um, I was amazed that we even got to that, to be perfectly honest, uh, given the circumstances of what was going on uh, behind the scenes at the book. So those would be like the real proud moments there. So at what point did you uh, really get free reign? It was really fairly early. I, I, you know, you have to understand, sure, we would pitch ideas um, to Sega and Archie early on. Like, we would send them, like, a couple of sentences or paragraphs, said, this is what we want to do, and they'd say, and for the most part, they said, yay. Okay? Uh, the only other storyline they had a problem with initially, and this was Bob Harris, was... Uh, what eventually became the Sonic Live special. And the storyline, the reason he had a problem with that is he thought I was doing it as sort of like uh, to feature my own son and, and, and niece in the thing. But it wasn't that I wanted to feature my son or niece in the book. It was, it was more or less, okay, I could feature any two kids. Basically, I wanted to have Sonic interact in our world with a boy and a girl and you know, they end up at Sega headquarters and that was the initial impetus for it. And Bob couldn't see for some strange reason, he couldn't see uh, the fun possibility of having Sonic actually, you know, come to Sega. You know, I, I was, I was kind of, you know, bewildered by that one, but he said, no, and so I just put that in my back pocket for later, but except for that and one other idea, I just kept on submitting to the editors and, you know, Scott Fulop and then Justin Gabri, and they just basically kept asking me, what else you got? You know, so I never really felt after the first few issues any constraint, whatever I wanted to do. Um, like I said, the only... The only nitpicking in the early scripts were Bob Harris rewriting some of Mike's jokes, which, like I said, ticked off Mike. Right. But other than that, you know, uh, uh, the only other time that Justin actually stepped in was uh, when I was doing the story arc um, that introduced Knuckles' mom and Julie Sue and the Echidna Civilization. And I indicated that there was a, uh, a population of dingoes that were, uh, 
they were sort of like allegorical uh, with the Nazi party and had sort of, had symbology that was reminiscent of the Nazis and so on. As far as I was concerned, these guys were the bad guys. And, you know, you found Nazis in Sergeant Fury and Sergeant Rock. So I, I didn't see what the problem was. It's, it's not like Marvel or DC were looking to alienate an audience, you know, that kids were picking up these books. So I didn't see the problem, but Justin felt we had to stay away from that board. You know, just like uh, initially when um, uh, in, in the storyline, uh, The Forgotten Tribe, where I had Knuckles' mother uh, make a, a gesture, you know, like Catholics do with the, the sign of the cross, you know, and Justin said, no, 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 let's, let's stay away from that. But other than those, those kind of things, uh, I never really felt constrained at, at all. Uh, it wasn't until the last few storylines I was working on under editor Mike Pellerito that I felt Mike was inserting himself way too much into the process. And I said, this is no longer fun anymore if he's going to um, insert himself like this. He didn't have any problem with what I was doing prior to this until I got up to the shadow storyline. And then he started to insert himself way too much into the process. And I said, um, this is no longer fun. I got to figure things out. So 